So to start our conference and to start our journey, I am pleased to welcome to the stage an esteemed researcher, a thought leader, and a good friend. Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy, the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is with us today from Washington, DC. As you'll read in the program, we have full bios for everybody. Uh, we have a lot of people with really impressive biographies. So rather than us reading all of the highlights, we'll leave it to you to take a look at those. But I do want to say he has affiliations with universities in Bangalore, with Rutgers, with Mississippi State, Kansas State, and Oregon State. But I consider him a Hoosier from a state perspective, but more importantly, a Boilermaker. Uh, Sonny spent time at the Purdue College of Agriculture, and that's where we first crossed paths when he led their ag research programs with tremendous vision and leadership. So today, we not only look forward to his comments, but are also pleased to have him back here at home and have the opportunity to remind him of just how great Indiana's ag biosciences sector really is. Sunny, stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Woo. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be back home. Uh, Beth, I appreciate your invite for me to be part of this very important conversation about, I love the hashtag ag innovation. And uh, uh, across America, and across the globe for that matter, we've got incredible energy in, in, in helping develop the innovations that we need uh, to address some of the very critical challenges that we've got. And uh, so in, uh, Beth had suggested that I might, might ought to think of this sort of a, a title for my uh, comments here over the next half hour or so. Uh, the world is our ag biosciences stage. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But I want to do a subtitle as well. And the subtitle really is about these transformative innovations that we need uh, for our 21st century uh, food systems. And, uh, and there's critical need for these innovations. And I had the privilege of uh, being back on uh, campus at Purdue University uh, uh, yesterday and had a wonderful visit with a number of my friends and former colleagues and students and faculty and others. And uh, so we, we spoke about innovations that we need. As you know, there's incredible energy here in Indiana and in, at, uh, at Purdue University to the lieutenant governor's uh, comments about being pioneers. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it that Indiana is a pioneer and, and the, the energy in this whole space of innovations is incredible, and it's very well reflected on campus at Purdue University as well. Also got to uh, see many of the young people here talk to some of our blue jackets that are here today, and some of our green jackets that are probably not in their green jackets, because I didn't see any green jackets here. And, uh, you know, really, they're the future of our, of our world. And uh, it's incredible that uh, we've got uh, really, really smart, amazing young people and uh, we can all, all of the adults sitting in this room, uh, we can all rest assured that uh, our young people, exemplified by our 4-H'ers and our FFA'ers, uh, that we're going to be in good hands uh, when they come on stage here in another 20, 30, 40 years or whatever. So uh, wonderful to have these young people here as well. And every time I give a, a speech like this, I, I do at least one or two speeches every week and uh, all over America. And uh, every time I do these sorts of speeches, and even yesterday when I was on campus at uh, Purdue, I framed my conversation around the fact that we have an existential threat. And some of you have heard me speak to this uh, already. There's many Purdue people here that heard me speak to this as well yesterday. And uh, this existential threat, what I mean by that is happening now. You know, we all talk about how uh, in the year 2050 something bad's going to happen because we're going to have a population of over 9 billion people, and we got climate change, and we got all these other things that are going on. Something really, really bad's going to happen. But I like to say it's happening right now. And this happening right now is this term, nutritional security. And I myself prefer to use nutritional security, and we have in our agency been using that now for some time, rather than the term food security in part because what I mean by nutritional security, is there are two aspects to it. One aspect is tonight, globally, we'll have about 850 million people that'll go to bed hungry tonight. And here in America, uh, according to the Economic Research Service, one of our sister agencies within USDA, 
we've got about uh, 16 million households that have been food insecure at some time during the last year. That's about 50 million people in the United States of America that have been food insecure. Oh, by the way, almost 3 million households with children are intensely food insecure. There are many, many parts of rural America and urban America where we have food deserts. We can feed the entire world, and yet we've got hunger in the United States and around the world as well. And as a result of this hunger, globally, tonight, 29,000 people will drop dead for lack of food. That puts it in perspective for us to think of. And, and then the flip side of it is that we'll have tonight 1.3 billion people globally, adults, before going to bed, have to take Lipitor for cholesterol, baby aspirin for heart disease, medication for type 2 diabetes, medication for hypertension and things like that. Here in America, one out of five adults, in this audience here, we got one out of five adults that has to take those drugs to be able to have some semblance of normalcy. And oh, by the way, uh, as a result of the metabolic disorders, these chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease and things like that, we'll have tonight globally about 50,000 people that will drop dead. So you've got the two bookends of this nutritional security situation, hunger resulting in death and excessive amounts of calories resulting in death as well. And in fact, Ursula Bauer, she's with the Centers for Disease Control, she says she's done some incredible research in this area. She, she says, tells us that uh, 75% of America's healthcare costs, and as you know, that's the fastest growing part of the economy, 75% uh, of it is attributable to chronic disease, such as these metabolic disorders and cancer and things like that. Oh, by the way, off that, if you look at what's contributing to those chronic diseases and things like that, only about 10% or so is attributable to the genetics of the individuals. About 10% is attributable to the level of activities, the sedentary lifestyles versus active lifestyles. And almost 80% of it is literally attributable to the amount of food we consume, literally the number of calories we consume and the quality of those calories, i.e., we do not consume as many fruit and vegetables and nutrient-dense uh, types of uh, foods either. So that's the context that we've got when I talk about nutritional security as being an existential threat. And that's happening right now with about 7.5 billion people. Imagine what's going to happen in the context of uh, what I refer to as the perfect storm. And this perfect storm is being driven by the burgeoning population, which is projected out to be about anywhere between 9.5 and 10 billion people in just the next about 30 years or so. And in that context, because that population needs to have more cities built, needs to have more automobiles, needs to have more television sets, and, you know, these materialistic uh, sort of an environment that we're in, as a consequence of that, we're going to have to burn a lot more fossil fuels, and a consequence of that is a continued increase in our carbon footprint, and a continuing increase in the, our carbon footprint is contributing to the uh, you know, additional uh, challenges with uh, global warming and climate change and things like that as well. Along with that, you've got a whole slew of other uh, challenges that we've got to think of. These are wicked problems. We've got the technology and knowledge to be able to address this, but we cannot deploy it because humans, we can't agree on how to go about doing it, so we start butting heads. And so I, I refer to it as being wicked problems. And, you know, conflicts and migration. We've got millions of people that are moving. Again, the driver has been climate change, food costs, fuel costs, and all of that is contributing to conflicts as well. And the globalization and trade that is going on right now. We see here in, in uh, Indiana and Michigan, places like that, for example, because we import a lot of stuff from China and other places on those wooden pallets. In those wooden pallets are... Uh, you know, these beetles called the emerald ash borer or the Asian longhorn beetle or whatever else that you've got, they've destroyed, they've basically taken out, the emerald ash borer alone has basically taken out over 100 million ash trees in America. 
And along with that, you got the marmorated stink bug. Then you got UG99, a disease of uh, wheat. We don't have very good genetics against that particular pathogen. And we've got diseases like wheat blast and rice blast and on and on. You know, we got all manner of stuff that is going around because of this global trade that's going on and uh, people are moving as well. If you look at the occurrence of Zika virus, the occurrence of various species of mosquitoes that are transmitting these diseases of uh, uh, public health, human health, animal health, etc. These are all coming to play. And then we're doing all of this in the context of an anti-intellectual, anti-science environment in a nation like America, and now Western Europe is trying to follow suit as well, and the rest of the world is following suit, of this anti-intellectual, anti-science environment that we've got, blessed with the most incredible engines of discovery and knowledge generators, and blessed with the most incredible media and things like that. We still have this environment in which we, we have to operate of this anti-science, anti-intellectual environment that we've got as well. And so... When you narrow it down to our food systems, our producers are at the core of everything that we do. Every one of us has to think of those farmers and livestock producers as we're thinking of the innovations that we need as well. And these producers that we've got, these farmers and livestock producers we have, they're being barraged literally by a whole slew of non-living conditions like climate change, like environmental degradation, like the policies and regulations, like uh, immigration or the lack thereof, you know, policies and things like that. And along with that, we've got a whole slew of biological constraints as well, such as insects and pathogens and weeds and other issues that are biologically derived. And so it's almost like our farmers and livestock producers are caught in a vice grip and being squeezed. And these ag innovations that we're talking about, this ag biosciences that we're talking about, it literally is our ability to alleviate that pressure on our producers so that, that they can do what they need to do as well. And so I don't want to leave particularly our young people here thinking, oh my gosh, you know, these old folks here, they're going to leave a mess for us here in the next 30 years or so. And I'm absolutely optimistic. People know me that I'm the, the eternal optimist. I know we have demonstrably shown, globally, humanity has shown, and particularly America has shown, that we can indeed take on these problems and these challenges and address them. And there's just a graphic, a quick graphic, of just a few of the key inventions and discoveries that have taken place over the last, since, ever since, in quotes, agriculture was invented back about 10 to 15,000 years ago. All matter of inventions that have taken place. And today we've got, you know, the Internet of uh, Things and, and robotics and smart systems and genomics and on and on. All of these are part of that, in that timeline that we've got. We've been doing it. And here's one example of that. On the, on the bottom left of your screen, that is Teosinte. Teosinte is the ancestor of the modern corn plant. And that's an American quarter to give you a sense of the size. And the Mesoamericans, the Native Americans, natives of Mesoamerica, i.e. the Mexican highlands, they figured out how to take that and get to that. And there's the American quarter, by the way. And along the way, if you look at, again, the timeline, and ever since they figured this from this to this, you know, we used to get about 5, 10 bushels per acre, 20 bushels per acre. And then science and innovations kick into gear. Work undertaken at Purdue, at the University of uh, Illinois, Iowa State University, the Agricultural Research Service and others. We are able to now get very easily about 175, 180 bushels of corn per acre. That's almost an exponential growth in the yields. So we've demonstrably shown that this can happen, that we can indeed take on these challenges and we can address them as well. So there is a path forward. It's not that we're going to be all going there, oh, woe is me, what are we going to do about this? There is a path forward. It is those innovations that we need. And we need the sort of the transformative discoveries, uh, 21st century abilities to translate that knowledge and deliver it to the end users through extension, this very Amer uh, uniquely American enterprise. Things going on in farming systems. I just saw a tweet going up down in the bottom about uh, China, hashtag China, hashtag vertical farming and things like that. There's all manner of new farming systems that are coming along. I gave a keynote address for the American Vertical Farming uh, Summit here a couple of months ago in Washington, D.C. Things that are going on. We need help in thinking of policies and regulations and things like that so that it eases the burden on those producers, for example, in regards to the infrastructure that we need. And 
And, oh, by the way, this amazing enterprise is a well-kept secret. If you go and walk on the street in Indianapolis and ask them where their food comes from, they might say from the local Safeway or Kroger's or whatever grocery store that they go to. They don't know that there is this blood, sweat, and tears that went into producing that food that is made available to us. But today what I want to do is to just focus, because of the time that we've got, on the transformative discoveries. I can speak to each one of these topics for maybe an hour or two or three or whatever you want me to do. But I'll stick to the transformative discoveries. Maybe in future years, Beth will invite me back to speak to those other things too. So my own agency, the National Institute of uh, Food and Agriculture, uh, as you heard uh, in the introduction, uh, uh, that uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is part of the United States Department of Agriculture. We're the science agency. We invest funding in those innovations that we need. We invest funding for translating those innovations into solutions to address problems. We invest resources in helping you know, uh, support the education and training of our 4-H programs and FFA programs and our students that are here, uh, college students as well. All of those programs fall under our purview. And, and so our intent really is to catalyze. I mean, we don't do any of this work. It's the work that people, scientists around America do and the educators do that we support. We don't do any of this work. We're the catalyst. And the catalysis that we do is really to convene the best brains and monetary resources to be able to take on these challenges and come up with the solutions as well. And so, but the innovations, the discoveries, the new knowledge that's being generated, if it is published in some scientific journal or textbook, in and of itself is not enough. If that knowledge ends up in a journal article on a bookshelf and doesn't see the light of day, it is not at all of any worth to us. So for us, it's critically important that that knowledge is put to work. Science needs to be put to work. And you got to take the discoveries and translate it and deliver it to the end users. I like to say what we do is what we do. We have the privilege of supporting institutions like Purdue and the others across America. That science that's being undertaken is inspired by the end users. And when once the science is undertaken, it's translated, it's delivered to the end users, and ultimately transforms people's lives. A good example is sitting right here in front. These young people, the programs that Purdue and the other universities offer through our Cooperative Extension Service is about transforming these young people's lives uh, across the United States of America. There's a cl you know, classic example of what's going on as well. And so there is, as we're thinking about what NIFA does, what we need to do collectively is we've got to think of this sort of a nexus that we've got and to make sure that what is being done is done in a sustainable uh, approach, that it ensures that these young people are not going to be burdened with the unintended consequences of everything that we do. So this, this nexus of food and energy and water and health and other things that we've got that we have to be uh, very much taking into consideration. It's not just enough to go ahead and say, we're going to increase yields. Not enough to do that. It's, we got to make sure also that it's a profitable enterprise. We also got to make sure that it's going to result in better health outcomes, going back to the nutritional security that I was referring to, that it uses a lot less water and things like that as well. And indeed, if you drill down a little further, there's a really exquisite connectivity between food, agriculture, and health. What we frame in our in the approaches that we've taken and the investments that we make is that if you focus on this part of the, the chart, uh, this part of the chart, you'll see that the interrelatedness of plant health, animal health, environmental health, economic health, and human health all being interrelated. If you tweak in one area, you're going to have an impact in some other area. So you've got to be very mindful that in thinking along those nexus lines that you're really addressing all of those and that's the only way we're going to be able to secure our future. And, and here's some examples uh, of, of the kinds of things that could go on. And uh, I'll leave the slides here. Anybody wants it, they're welcome to uh, uh, take them as well. And there's a lot more information in there that gives you a sense of the kind of thinking that we're uh, all about. Is really ensuring this nexus that is what we're all about. And I think, you know, and we'll be listening to the panel discussions as well. They're going to be looking at those sorts of connectivities and thinking about the ag innovations that we need in the enterprises that we're involved in as well. 
So when you're thinking about the sustainable nutritional security, there's multiple components to it. Right smack dab in the middle are our producers, our farmers, number one. And those farmers, they really, really have to be concerned about typically about three things. There's many more, but typically about three things that sort of bring everything together. One of those is productivity. That is, they got to be able to produce more with a lot less, a lot fewer inputs. Second one is those fewer inputs, that ecological footprint needs to be mitigated. And the third component, last but not least, very critically important, is profitability. If all the wonderful science that goes on, all the innovations don't support greater levels of profitability for our farmers, then we might as well go ahead and close shop and go home and do something else. All the greatest inventions and discoveries being made by the professors and the PhD students and the postdocs sitting in this audience here means nothing at all if it doesn't take that into account on the profitability piece of it. The flip side of that, of course, we need for producers, you got to have consumers as well. And for consumers, there's multiple different domains for them. Obviously, it's access to food. In fact, in America, we talk about food deserts. In the city that I live and work in, Washington, D.C., many of you come to Washington, D.C., and you'll go hopefully see all the beautiful monuments and museums that we've got. And if you were to take the time to just go across the Anacostia River into Ward 7 and Ward 8, for about 100,000 people in that, those communities, there's just about one and a half, maybe two grocery stores. Actually, it's only one major grocery store for 100,000 people. You can imagine the challenges of having to go there. So the easy access is to a local 7-Eleven that give, or a McDonald's that gives you 1,300 calories, 1,200 calories in one sitting. In a day, you can consume 4,000 calories. And, oh, by the way, you're going to end up having those issues related to the obesity and things like that as well. So that's access to food and that it's affordable. And, uh, oh, by the way, it is nutritionally adequate to allow them to go ahead and assimilate those nutrients so that you can need, for children, for example, the first 1,000 days are critically important. In places where we have food deserts, in rural America, on Indian reservations, in, uh, in the Appalachians, all of these places we've got children that are stunted. Their brain development is not at the same level as the remaining population. In fact, it's not unlike what we see in countries in Africa, in Asia and other places. So we've got to make sure that in the innovations that we're going to develop, we have to ensure that that is going to come out as well, that it is nutritionally uh, going to help those uh, you know, people develop and grow and, you know, and all that, be healthy and things like that too. And another component to this whole conversation is the ecological footprint of food and agriculture itself. And if you, it is one of the most intensely ecologically expensive propositions for us. Almost 80% of the fresh water that you and I consume globally is in the food we consume. About almost a fifth of the energy we consume is in the food we eat. About a quarter of the greenhouse gases we produce globally is in the food we eat. If you're a rice eater, it takes a lot more water. If you're a milo eater, sorghum, it takes a lot less water. And so those are the sort of context that you got. But on average, this is the challenge that we've got. And what we're challenging our scientific community, these innovators that we've got in the private sector, in the non-governmental sector, in, in uh, the academic sector, is we've got to cut that ecological footprint by at least 50%. It's a stretch goal. There's a lot of amazing work that's going on at uh, now Dow AgroSciences, Pioneer, DuPont. It means everybody's getting uh, taken over by everybody else. There's a lot of consolidation happening. We're going to be one big happy family ultimately. Bayer, Monsanto, Dow, et cetera, et cetera, all going to come together. No, seriously. Everybody has a stake in this matter. But we've got to work towards it. It's a stretch goal, but we, unless we, we set our minds to wanting to do it, we're not going to get there. And really, we're going to have to decarbonize as well. Because agriculture is contributing absolutely positively to climate change. And climate change is having a very significant impact, not only on our crops and livestock animals, 
For example, we're providing funding to the University of Missouri and Oklahoma State University and Texas A&M University to look at uh, cattle breeds that can consume food under high temperatures and still be able to produce meat or milk or whatever. University of Delaware, we've given funding. They went to, on an expedition to Africa to bring back chickens to breed in with the American breeds so those chickens now can withstand those higher temperatures and, and so on. Those are the kinds of things that need to happen. We've got to decarbonize. If we don't do it, we're going to be leaving these young people here with the challenges that I was referring to earlier. So there's some low-hanging fruit as well. It's not only in the fact that we're going to grow all this amazing um, you know, stuff uh, in terms of uh, uh, genomics and drones and robotics and all that. Food waste and food loss is a pretty significant challenge. Globally, in developing countries, about a third to half the food is lost before the dinner table. In countries like America and Canada and Western Europe, about a third to half the food is lost after the dinner table. And uh, the Economic Research Service says, you can't read it very well, that in America, you and I, I've seen the enemy and it's us, collectively, we're wasting and losing 131 billion, with a B, pounds of food per year. That constitutes 1,200 calories of food per man, woman, and child per day. An average adult needs about 2,100 calories to thrive, not just to survive. And 1,200 calories is a bit more than half of that caloric need that we've got. And that's what we're doing. Oh, by the way, oops, it uh, turns out simple things can be done. You go to grocery stores, I don't know what's happening here in Indiana. I know this is from uh, a few months ago, in, and I saw that last week as well as the thing is still there. It gives you a sell-by date on milk, for example. What the hell does that mean? So it's the March the 15th, and you still got half a gallon of milk. You say, oh my gosh, this milk is gone bad, you're going to pour it down. Well, never mind that that milk was pasteurized. You can, if it's properly refrigerated, you can drink it for another week. And you can always do the smell test before you go ahead and drink it. Right? And simple things that have been done today in, in Kansas City and, and other places, you see this. It says, Best Buy. So there's no, it's pretty foolproof. You know, you see that, Best Buy, you know it's Best Buy. So you don't continue, continue to consume it because it may make you sick or something like that. That's something, the simple things that are being done. And this is what gets me, okay? I was at the local Safeway in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And there's the father and the daughter. Daughter's busy, of course, with her handheld device, Beth Beckdahl. And the father went, and he actually was at the beautiful pyramid of uh, uh, peaches and pears and things like that. And tomatoes. He pick it up, squeeze it, smell it, and put it back. And he picks up another one, squeezes, and puts it in his little basket. He's doing that here, by the way, with the broccoli. And then I see this young man come by and see this. He's going around from those pyramids, picking the ones that have gotten soft and squishy. He's throwing them in there. And so I said to him, how many boxes do you do per day? He said, in his in the hours that he works, his shift, he ends up doing about half a dozen to nine or ten boxes. Again, I've seen the enemy. It's us. I go to buy avocados because I want to make guacamole. I pick it up. It's got to be the right kind of squishiness to it. Can't be too hard. It's the Goldilocks approach, right? And that's what we're trying to do is the Goldilocks approach. And imagine where that hand has been. You don't even know where that hand's been. It's depositing. Every time a set of hands come on, it's depositing something on it. And that's what's going on. And then, again, I've seen the enemy and it's us. But this is in America. Not in Europe, by the way. They get small portions. Here in America, of course, we want to supersize everything. And this is breakfast in Montana. I was at Montana State University. Got up. Four of us eating breakfast. Here's the healthy fellow wanting to get uh, uh, oatmeal, right? He ends up leaving half his oatmeal. And there's a, a woman who got uh, a big full breakfast. You know, she ends up leaving half. This is me right here. More than half the food is remaining on the plate. There's no need for that. They could have just given me one egg, one slice of toast, and one piece of meat or something like that, like a bacon or something like that. 
right? We left all that food, and that's what's contributing to that 131 billion pounds that I was referring to. And it's like you and I taking our cash and throwing it in the toilet. $120 billion worth in America. And then you multiply it globally. And we don't even, you know, we talk about the doubling food production. We don't even do double if we address this. Because half the food's going down the toilet. We can cut water loss. One quadrillion liters of water is lost in the food wasted and lost. That's the equivalent of seven volumes of Lake Erie. One quadrillion liters of water. Okay? We don't have a whole lot of water left. And, of course, climate change. It's like taking out over 30 million cars off the street if you were to address this situation. That's low-hanging meat, uh, uh, low-hanging fruit. We really need your innovations. Those hashtag ag ag innovations, there's some incredible opportunities in addressing food waste and food loss and things like that. Maybe there's some behavioral changes that we need to be thinking of. People don't have, you know, we, in America, we like to eat with our eyes, not with our stomachs. Uh, Brian Wansink at Cornell University says, the average American thinks of food 200 times a day. Crazy. I don't know, he's not done any work overseas, but I think in America we're really good. We're number one. We like to be number one in a lot of things. Whoop. I, back it up, please. Sorry. Somebody needs to back it up. Thank you. So the cool part is these young people sitting here, man, talk about the innovation, the innovators that they are. There's a lot of young people going around wanting to take food, waste, and make it into something valuable. University of Maryland students came up with this idea to take fruit and vegetables that's all squishy in those boxes and make it into ugly juice. You don't even know what's in there, right? But it tastes so good, you're going to go ahead and consume it. And all manner of things that are going on. And from food, of course, you can make fuel, right? There are people here at Purdue University that are doing that. You go to McDonald's, get all the oil from them, the French fry oil, and convert that into biodiesel or whatever you want to do as well. So those sorts of innovations that we need as well. It's not only on the production side, on the input side, but also on the other side that we need as well. So there's multiple different approaches. We like to think of them. Be certain that there's no unintended consequences, that you're really paying attention to these things. And data science is needed. We s desperately need data science, big data as we call it, as well as the education of our young people as well. I'm going to skip through this, but I want to remind you, it is, remember this word, profitability. Got to remember that if we don't. Farm incomes, by the way, over the last five years or so have been very depressed in America, globally for that matter. And a lot of farmers are leaving the enterprise. Farming enterprise, our farmers, is the fastest aging population that we've got. We've got to be very concerned, but not enough to be making all these great innovations and discoveries and all that. So there's a path forward to all of this, and this is just a, a bunch of like a, a, a stream of consciousness uh, words that I threw up on this uh, uh, slide here. And, and I just want to, you know, you know, in genotyping, phenotyping, I had this privilege, uh, Karen Plout, I don't know if she's here, she took me to this pretty cool facility, uh, phenomics facility, funded by all of y'all uh, and, and others, including me, my agency, and ARPA and others. Uh, she took me around, great work going on, but one of the things that I want you to think of is this. Forever, for a long time, everything that we did was observational. And then... We switched in the last about a uh, couple of three decades or so into informational science. And today, we're on the threshold of making it predictive science. We should be able to predict that cow with this genetics, with this environment that it's in, with this management, you should be able to predict how many, how many pounds of milk will it produce, how many pounds of meat will it produce, or that corn plant that is stuck in space and uh, is... How many pounds will it produce? You can be predicting that as well. And the opportunities, these innovations that we need are throughout the entire supply chain, from the farm to the trash can. We need smart minds to help us think this through. And it's really throughout, smart refrigerators. You know, we're giving money to University of Arizona on meat, you know, that sits in the back of that refrigerator. It turns kind of gray, and you pick it up, you smell it, or it's fish or something like that. You forgot about it for two or three weeks. You got to throw it in the trash can. A lot of money, a lot of water, a lot of energy, a lot of labor, et cetera, went into it. And so there's a shrink wrap on it. 
It does the litmus paper test, the, the, the smell test for you. If it starts smelling because of certain chemistries that are being produced, chemicals that are produced in that rotting meat or fish, it changes color so you know it's, there's a foolproofness to it. And the cool part is it'll send you a message to your smartphone saying that, uh, hey, you know what? That meat that's sitting in the fridge is going bad. You better hurry up and you know, eat it or do whatever with it. Make a goulash with it or something like that. And also the opportunities, the, the innovations that we need in the world of uh, the bioeconomy. And a couple of examples. On the 14th of November of 2016, this Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 flew out from Seattle Tacoma Airport, flew to Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. That's my former boss right there, Tom Vilsack, and Maria Cantwell, the senator from um, Washington State. That airplane, get your heads wrapped around this, flew on wood chips. That jet airplane. Kind of difficult to fathom that. They took funding that we provided to Washington State University, University of Washington, Oregon State University, etc., converted those wood chips into jet fuel, and that airplane flew. Here's another thing. This is sugar beet. The sugar beet, the juice, is a fantastic component of the de-icers on our highways in the wintertime. You know, remember how we used to use a lot of salt? Now you incorporate this juice, and you're in pretty good spot. These bottles are all made from plants. Research done at LSU, Louisiana State University. Research done at the University of Wisconsin, funded by us and by others as well. A lot of opportunities here. We need those innovations in this space as well. But it's not enough for our farmers to just produce food. You've got to have some value-added opportunities that they can get some additional uh, money out of, this, uh, out of their endeavors as well. So and innovations that we need in smart systems and drones and robotics and things like that, sensors, rapid diagnostics. Again, it's throughout the entire food system. And uh, here's a farm. Looks like a Norman Rockwell picture of this horizontal farm. Except that you see uh, these little, little signs for sensors. The average farm today may have 1,500, 2,000 or more sensors on them. They're all constantly emitting things and they're being picked up by handheld devices. Farmers, in addition to being agronomists and soil scientists and water scientists and all that, they got to be data scientists as well. Here's an example. So, Microsoft, it's called Farm Beats. Google Farm Beats, you'll see it. So, all that data, how do you get it out? We don't have the bandwidth. And so, what they're doing is they're using the unused television spectrum. Microsoft is coming up with this idea to get these data so you can process it. And then you've got robots that are running around. This is University of California, Davis. It can tell a weed plant, not the smoking kind from a strawberry plant, and if it's a weed plant, it zaps it with a laser. It's got onboard sensors and algorithms to be able to tell that, or it can deploy a drone to go and spray as needed, or even to pollinate some crops. So we've got research that we provide at the University of Arizona that goes around pollinating crops with the, the mechanical drones. This is actually being sold, as you know, by uh, companies like Monsanto and John Deere and others. And here's an example of what the possibilities are. This young man, he grew 500 bushels of corn. He brought everything together. So talk about the innovations that we've got in there, the genetics, the sensors, the diagnostics, the, the analytics and things like that that went into making that happen. And uh, a lot of work that's going on in hacking food. Understanding what food is all about. There's companies like Hampton Creek and others that are saying to us that they're going to just molecularly understand food and tell us how food can be made. But I think this is all going to fail, personally, because food is about culture. Sitting at a dinner table and eating that wonderful pork or beef or wine from whatever state, including Bill Oliver's uh, wine here. And uh, things that are being done in regards to meat replacements that you can grow meat in petri dishes and things like that, except it costs about $50,000 currently for a hamburger, as you probably know. Uh, so these green ones are all areas where we provided funding, by the way. NIFA has provided funding. And precision foods. So you've heard of precision medicine, where based on my genetic makeup, I can get the kind of medication that I need. We're tantalizingly close to be able to do that in the world of food as well. 
because we've got the individual genome that we can do. You see, in $49.99, Thanksgiving uh, special deal that you got that uh, uh, various companies offer to do your gene uh, genetic sequencing today, right? You could take that, the epigenome, the microbiome, all of that, put it together with the same components of plants and animals. And then you got wearable sensors like Apple Watches and uh, Oregon State University uh, professor has come up with contact lenses that can measure the, the sugar and it sends a signal to your smartphone so you remind you go ahead, get an injection or eat something or whatever. And behaviors and analysis, all, all of it is big data analytics. And in fact, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Food and Nutrition Service has these apps, by the way, that you can download called Super Tracker. And so we're getting closer and closer to be able to really precisely say what it is, what food's going to do, help us think of, and things like that. So what we do, my agency does, is to provide funding. You know, really, it is to achieve this global nutritional security is what we do. The innovations that we need, the discoveries that we need, the knowledge that we need, and the young people that we need to continue to prime this and move it forward. So... We talk about genomes to field, all the, all the omics information. How do you, what is happening in the field, in that cow, in that uh, uh, animal? In the roots, we got uh, ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency is coming up with uh, robots, they call them worm bots, to go around in the roots to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, Purdue University has got some work that's going on on above ground as well as below ground types of things. And so this is all coming together, this convergence. Beth used that term, convergence. And uh, in fact, Ray Kurzweil, K-U-R-Z-W-E-I-L, he is the secretary of the future for Google, by the way. He's a futurist. All he thinks about is the future. Ray is, uh, Kurzweil has written a bunch of articles. He calls it singularity. I like to think of it as being the convergence to singularity. There's a whole slew of things coming together biological, biophysical, etc. But we got to be concerned about the policies, the regulations, and the angst people have, you know, against GMO, against whatever it is, gene editing and things like that. We got to be very, very concerned about it. Got to make sure that the social sciences, the humanities are every bit a part of this enterprise as the biophysical sciences are. I'm almost done. But a reminder is really at the end of the day, is people that make decisions. All the greatest innovations and gizmos and doodads mean diddly if we don't take into consideration people. Remember what happened with Terminator, Gene, and all that, Starlink and things like that. People that are a little bit older know about all these things. We gotta avoid that. We can learn, we have learned from it, and the ag innovations that we need, hashtag ag innovations, has to incorporate into it the human dimensions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sunny. I will uh, use the discretion of the chair to keep us on time, but I have one question for you, then I hope that you'll be able to stay for just a little bit uh, during some breaks. How, how does NIFA and the state of Indiana and some of our research institutions partner uh, on some of these things? How, how can we create a partnership that helps address some of what, yep. what you described? Well, Beth, you know, any more, it's not the government that's going to be the sole investor in these things. The public is not the sole investor. It really needs to, I like to, you know, you heard me say this earlier, crowdsource the best brains and the best monetary resources, intellectual and monetary resources to come together. And that's critically important, and we see a lot more of it, these public-private partnerships and things like that, and the non-governmental entities. And so, uh, uh, so the approaches that we're using is to convene conversations, and uh, in those convenings that we do, we invite. So we held a summit on big data in September of last year in Chicago. So IBM, Oracle, Google, uh, Farm Bureau, and the universities, the government, and non-governmental organizations, commodity groups, all came together. So when we do these alerts, we invite everybody to come together, to partner together, to come up with ways of... Uh, bringing the intellectual and monetary resources together. And those are the approaches that we use, and I think that really works very well. And the other thing is, 
you know, networking, like you're, that you're enabling happen here. You've got people from various backgrounds here. That's the other part of it as well. It's the awareness or the lack thereof that prevents us from deploying these best intellectual resources. And those are some of the approaches that we've used successfully and that would certainly be of relevance to what you're talking about as well. Excellent. Well, keep us on your radar screen. We will certainly do that. definitely yeah. on ours. Indeed, indeed, so, yeah. Please uh, Thanks very much, give folks. Sunny a warm round of applause for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.